the greatest way to increase your success is to be willing to fail more. Welcome to the Never Employed Chat. My name is Sam and I interview people who make a living beyond salary jobs, entrepreneurs, business owners and investors, so that we can learn from their stories together. There are many great ways to make a living and even more ways to wealth. At Never Employed, we encourage you to think of alternatives to employment jobs. What would you do if a salary job was simply no option? But what does go for now about? go for no is fundamentally a concept that teaches people that the most certain way to achieve success um, in almost any area of life, and in particular sales, is to intentionally increase your failure rate. And by that, I mean to intentionally increase the number of times that you have people say no to you. It's um, somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, most people assume that the way to get uh, a lot of yeses in your life would be to go for yes. And yet ultimately the most, uh, the most guaranteed strategy is to go for no. That's a very interesting concept. Maybe you want to uh, tell a little bit about how did you find about this concept and how did you start with all this? A absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, uh, my first serious job in business and in sales was working for my father in the automotive industry. Uh, I had worked for him for a couple of years. And one day he calls me in and tells me that I'm going into sales. Uh, you know, and I had no experience in sales whatsoever. I went down to my new office and sat there with a phone book, you know, in front of me on the desk with the, you know, phone in my hand, knowing that I had to call on prospects. And I sat there for a month, Sam, and I'm embarrassed to tell you, I made zero calls. Um, I never worked up the courage to dial the phone one time. And mostly because I knew what um, I knew what they were going to say. I knew that they were going to say no to me. And I had this lack of self-esteem. I didn't believe that my message, hey, my name is Richard Fenton, and I work for this great fleet dealership, and I want to offer our services to you. I didn't think that message was as important as whatever else it was that they had going at the time. So um, I quit my job. I, I quit my job moved away from Chicago to get, a, get as far away from the car business and as far away from my father's sales legend shadow as I could get. And I moved to Los Angeles. And interestingly, the very first job I took was in sales. <laughs> but, but this time I took a job in retail sales because in the world of retail, I felt like, you know, since I wanted to go out and make contact with strangers, I don't have to be quote cold calling. Um, Working in retail, it's got to be easy, right? You just stand on the sales floor. People park their cars. They, you know, they walk into the store. They tell you what you what they want, and you get it for them. So I'm working in this new job selling suits for a living. And uh, about two months, my sales are abysmal. I'm fairly certain they're going to fire me. And a gentleman, he was the district manager of this company, by the name of Harold was doing a store visit. And I thought, God, if I could just impress this guy on this one store visit, maybe they'll give me some more time, you know, to improve my sales. Well, Harold comes in at 8.30, um, you know, nine o'clock, we have coffee, the store opens up and I get the first up, meaning I get to take care of the first customer who walks in. In walks is a very well-dressed gentleman um, who immediately tells me he wants to buy an entire wardrobe of clothing. And I'm thinking, oh, you can't get any luckier than that, right? I've got this guy standing behind me who I'm trying to impress. I've got this customer who's telling me he wants to buy lots of merchandise. I'm going to prove what a great salesperson I can be. And for the next half hour, I took care of this customer. Um, he bought about $1,100 worth of clothing, which doesn't sound like much in today's money, but you have to understand this goes back to uh, 1980. And uh, um, we get all done. I ring up the sale. I send him on his way and I come back in the store and I'm waiting for Harold to congratulate me on my spectacular sale. And Harold doesn't say anything. So I'm starting to get a little bit frustrated. And, uh, you know, finally, Harold said, hey, that was a nice sale, kid. And I said, yeah, man, did you see that? Eleven hundred dollars. He bought a suit. He bought a sport coat. He bought slacks. He bought shirts, ties, shoes, socks, belts. I'm running through the list of everything this customer just bought from me. And Harold goes, whoa, he goes, stop. He goes, I, he goes, those are all the yeses. He says, what I'd like to know from you is what did the customer say no to? And I stopped and I thought about it and I stopped being defensive. 
And I reviewed the sale in my mind from beginning to end. And I realized the customer hadn't said no to anything. Every single thing I showed that man, he said yes to. And I said, Harold, he's, he didn't say no to anything. He said yes to everything. Then Harold asked me the other really great question. He said, well, then how did you know he was done? Well, I'm going to tell you, Sam, how I knew he was done as a young guy, mid-20s, not making big money, having never gone into a menswear store in my life and having spent a thousand dollars on clothing that to me was a huge amount of money i'd never done that so when you as a customer got to my mental spending limit you were done um you know i would just shut the sale down send you on your way and uh you know i i i, I had this huge you know a moment of enlightenment and harold said you know i watched you sell he goes and you're not half bad he said but your fear of the word no is going to kill you and then he added the final little magical words that, um, you know, I'm so grateful for him having said this. He said, but I have a feeling that if you could just get over that, he said, I think you're going to become one of the great ones. And it was so earth shattering to me that I went home that night and I thought, is it possible that this man is right? Is it possible that my vision of what I thought my function was, which was to get people to say yes to me. Is it possible that that is completely wrong, that my function on the job is to try to increase the number of times that people say no to me? And I made a decision that night that I was going to fail my way to success. And I went back into work the next day with the express goal of increasing the number of times that people said no to me. And it worked. I mean, all I can tell you is uh, you know, within a relatively short order, took about a year, I became an award-winning salesperson with that company that led me into being a training director and a manager, and eventually to, you know, to launching um, this company with Andrea, where we, hate, where we help people fundamentally learn the same basic message that the, the greatest way to increase your success is to be willing to fail more. That sounds very, very impressive. So in the end, uh, you're actually talking about fear, right? So it's uh, also about overcoming your fears. I'm deeper than that in regards to the fact that it's really a lack of self-esteem. It's a lack of belief that, um, that our time is as valuable uh, as the other person's time. And, and a, a misunderstanding that when people say no to us, that they're not rejecting us personally, that they're rejecting the product, the service, the price, the timing, the size, the color, you know, they're, they're rejecting a lot of different things and they're not personally rejecting us. It's the, the, the degree to which we take the rejection personally, where we believe that we are less than um, and that we're not worthy because that somebody has said no to us. And it's kind of funny, you know, we, we've made this joke before. Can you imagine the vanilla ice cream? Um, in a Baskin Robbins, you know, 31 flavor, you know, ice cream store that the vanilla, vanilla ice cream is sitting next to the, um, you know, to the uh, coconut fudge. And, you know, the customer comes in and orders the coconut fudge and the vanilla sits there and goes, oh, God, I'm rejected. They don't like me. No, it's not. They didn't like you. It's personal preference. They prefer the other one. It has nothing to do with you. And even when, even when somebody says no to you because they don't like you even when that happens because they don't like you that's still on them it has nothing to do with you because the next customer may come in and buy from you precisely because they do like you so did you change no you didn't change you're you what changed was the customer preference so when you get the rejection outside of yourself and you don't place it on yourself then it becomes easier to handle so then all these experiences uh, led you to eventually um yeah create this brand of go for now right um how long did this take and how how did this start in particular yeah well it, it's interesting i mean when 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 andrew and i decided to leave our corporate jobs and uh, this is back in 1997 um when we decided to leave our corporate jobs we um we started out by doing training just for the retail industry. 
And we had written a little book called Retail Magic. It was 64 pages long. It was a collection of stories and advice that we gave to, you know, retail store managers on how to, you know, in, how to improve their operation. And and we started doing training on this on this book. Well, we would go to um, these different conferences and we'd give a, you know, I, I would do a three hour workshop and people would come up on the break and afterward. And they only wanted to talk about one thing. They wanted to talk about the 20 minutes we did go for no. There was this little segment in the middle where we shared this story. And then everything else we said just kind of apparently was not that important to them. But the go for no thing is what captured their imagination. And so eventually we said, well, maybe go for no is our brand. Maybe, you know, maybe we should just focus on that. And so we got rid of everything else that we were training. We went exclusively with go for now. And then we decided to offer that concept, not just to the retail industry, but to all industries. So we went out to banking and real estate and uh, home-based businesses, right? You know, the, the Amways and the, um, uh, well, all of them, I'm not gonna name any more uh, of the world. And uh, we found out that, this was a universal issue. You know, this is not something that is unique to any particular, any particular industry. It's a, it's a human condition. So we didn't train for specific industries anymore. We trained toward a particular type of person who had this particular problem. And uh, after a few years, go for no, literally the, the phrase go for no became a brand. We trademarked it, federal trademark. Um, and, uh, we, we, we fundamentally have stuck with this brand now for 20 years because it's a problem that, um, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of people have, we're never going to run out of customers. We're never going to run out of industries to market to. And, and, you know, as long as people are being born and reaching the age where they have to go in and get jobs, there will always be new people who, um, you know, will want this information. Yeah, absolutely agree. And uh, I also think, and I agree that this is a uh, yeah, very broad topic, um, which basically affects everyone who has anything to do with uh, sales or actually any, anyone who, who lives and uh, is able to get rejected in some way. Right. Um, so you actually just explained that your uh, idea and the brand on which you're working today um, actually evolved from uh, something more general, which you did before. So you actually started with a more general retail training. And uh, yeah, w would you say that for people who start some kind of business, um, is it essential to just um, start doing anything, even if you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> um, yeah, my, my father used to always say, do something, even if it's wrong. Uh, and, and that kind of goes to the, you know, the go for no failure way to success philosophy too, because, you know, you can, you can sit at your desk or in your living room on the sofa and try forever to make a decision in your head. Well, you know, to, to never think alone, you know, always get someone else involved. And one of the best people to get involved would be customers, you know, ask customers what they think by trying to sell them something. And you'll learn very quickly whether you're on the, the wrong track or the right track. Uh, I think people's failure to start is um is well it's enormous i mean let's face it every single person if you don't start you're not going to get anywhere um you know uh and and it, it's really kind of funny there's another thing i wanted to mention about this brand thing i had heard people say to us repeatedly uh, your customers will tell you what your brand is and i used to say well that's ridiculous your customers don't tell you what your brand is you decide what your brand is Right. You decide your are your Procter and Gamble and you decide you're going to create a product called Tide and then you're going to go out and market the heck out of it. And then people are going to your it's branding. Right. You're going to put money behind the branding. Um, it was really interesting because when we would go out and do these workshops and customers came up to us and they wanted to talk about go for no. Well, they were telling us what our brand was. And then one day we're in a we're in a retail store and we're with the vice president of this company and he says, "Hey, come with me. I want to show you what my employees did after you guys did your workshop." And he takes us down the hallway towards the lunchroom and the entire lunchroom wall had huge letters and it said "Go for no." And I thought, "Oh my, maybe our customers are telling us what our brand is." You know, so um all of that happened because we started 
you know, we could have said we could have sat forever trying to come up with a brand and, uh, you know, the brand may never have evolved. So is then there something which you could recommend to people who are just getting started, actually to getting started? So, oh, you mean you mean just just to make the decision to start? Yeah. And not only to make the decision, but uh, also to actually acting in, in a way. Yeah, um, you know, this is interesting because I, I've long wondered, is there a certain type of person who has the um, who has the ability and the willingness and the faith and the courage and the drive, you know, in order to put themselves out there? And I, I, I do think I do think at the core of this whole thing is the um, the willingness to fail. Uh, you, you, who wants to start something if your if your belief is that you have a significant chance of failure? Let's face it, most businesses, you know, are going to at least fifty percent or more are going to fail in the first five years. So whatever it is that you start, you have a better than fifty fifty chance of not making it. And if you don't have the courage and the willingness to fail, if you don't believe that failure is going to lead to something better, if you don't think that you can build on that failure, then I don't know why anybody would ever start anything. Uh, I started um, in the in the speaking training business, uh, you know, and moving towards training even within the corporate world, because I just love standing in front of a room and I love talking to people. Uh, I gave my first professional speech at the age of eight. And I'm not kidding. I, I gave a little speech in my in my basement about dinosaurs, and I charged everybody a nickel to come hear me, you know, lecture on the Paleozoic era. Um, and it was fabulous. You know, I finished and everybody clapped and I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Now, I didn't at that time envision I was going to write a book, and I didn't know how important writing the book was, but I had this thing that I wanted very badly. So wanting that thing to happen gave me enough courage and desire to fight through the potential of failure uh, to get me started. So the advice I would give is pick something that you truly love. And boy, everybody says it, you know, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life, which actually is good advice, um, is pick something that you believe in. Pick something that when you when you you bang your head up against the wall again and again and again, and people keep telling you no, that you don't go like, ah, oh, well, I was just hoping I, you know, I was just hoping it would try, you know. I'll I guess I'll go do something else. Pick something that you say, no, this is at the core of who I am. This is something that I believe is important. This is something, this is a message or a product or a service that the world needs so desperately that. I don't care how many people are going to say no to me or how many times I start and fail. I'm going to keep going until I figure it out. So if you don't start with something you believe in, the chances of success are, are minuscule, minuscule. But if you've got something you truly believe in and you're willing not to throw in the towel, you know, every time you, you, you know, you reach some form of resistance, then, uh, then you got a pretty good chance. And would you say that it's uh, that, habits are something that can you help with this so because it sounds like in the end it boils down to the fact that at some point you will get rejected no matter how successful oh, yeah. you may be yeah you know the, the, the habit that i don't want to be anti-habit i think habits are really important I've got a, a whole collection of bad ones. Um, you know, I could start with I could start with eating, you know, eating candy and snacking late at night. And I could, uh, you know, I could lay around the fact that I like to have a glass of wine most of the time with my dinner. And and, you know, you could you could debate whether these, you know, how badly these habits, you know, affect you. Um, I don't know that from a success standpoint that the habit thing is the first thing. I think that later on the habits can derail you i think they can hold you back um but you know the idea that somebody says i'm going to start a business so i'm going to start with good habits let's spend the next five years reading every book on habits and studying the, you know the habit world and um you know getting atomic habits on audio great book great audio i'm not complaining but 
you know, the habits to me are a secondary piece. They're very important in life in general. But as far as starting a business, getting successful in business, I'm much more in the favor of of discovering something that you think people need and then jumping in and offering it. And you'll find out what works and you'll find out what doesn't. And then eventually, if you're an entrepreneur, you better have some good habits. You better have the habit of, of, you know, getting up and turning on your computer every day. You better get in the habit of, you know, making calls, whether it's five calls a day or 50 calls a day, or if you're trying to write a book, writing four pages a day. I mean, these habits become very important. But the first thing, the first thing is to find something that you truly believe in and then start, you know, get a product, a service, an idea, something, and then offer it to people. Um, and then to me, the, the habits are are important, but secondary. Yeah. Then from this point of view, it sounds like um, you rather recommend people to, um, yeah, as you said, find something that you're really passionate about and uh, yeah, rather do things manually instead of trying to automate them uh, to, to some extent from, from the, from the beginning on. Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what I'm articulating, but um, I, I, I am saying that, uh, well, here's what I'm saying. I'm, uh, I've been in this business now, we've owned this business for almost 25 years. The um, business has afforded us a lifestyle that most people only dream of. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that's what happened. I still have a whole basket full of bad habits. Okay, I still have a bunch of things that I don't do as timely or as often or as well as I should. And so I think when people say habits are the most important thing, I just have to question it. I just have to I just have to question that. And so um, I just don't I, I don't I don't like people saying, like, I will work on my habits first. No, I think you have to find something you love, something that's important, something that people want. And then you, you can fine tune the habit stuff later. And yeah, you just mentioned again that you're already um, quite a long time in this uh, business and working on this brand. Um, would you say that your sales background and your um, background as a speaker initially helped you to start with this brand? And w would you say that uh, this would have been possible for you to build such a brand if you didn't do these other steps before? Yeah, that's a really that's a really great question. And um, it, it's completely my belief that if I had not spent the years toiling in the retail industry, if I had not had before that the bad experience trying to work in outside sales, uh, if I hadn't gotten a job where I was a, a, as a training director, I was standing on my feet eight hours a day, three days a week for, you know, for five years uh fine-tuning my craft, if you will, uh, had all those things not been there, yeah, I mean, the chances of the business having been successful would be significantly reduced. But that's another part of this whole thing is, you know, if you, if you, if you have a passion for something, I'm going to presume there's a basis for the passion. And if you pursue that passion to where whatever it is, you can master it. On the other hand, I'm just going to say this. When Andrea and I launched our business, we we came up with the three topics we were going to offer to retail organizations that they could hire us to come in and train on. We created the most god awful brochure you have ever seen in your life. It was a photocopied thing. You know, it, we we folded up three times, we stuck it in an envelope, we mailed them off to 500 companies, and um, we get a phone call from a very large retail organization and they said, oh, hey, we see this program you have on recruiting. You know, this looks really interesting. Um, do you, you know, do, do you have, do you have a, do you have the whole program like in, in writing? And we said, no, we don't have it in writing. And she goes, oh, okay, well, do you have like a speech that you've given on it that I can watch? And we said, well, no, we really don't have any videos. She said, okay, do you have an outline? And we said, We're, we're kind of new. She said, do you have business cards? I said, we're really new. And they hired us. So, 
you know, they hired us because we started. They hired us because we put it out there. They hired us because they had a need for what we were offering. And that when we got into deep conversation about what their needs were, they understood that we could help them. So it didn't matter how bad the brochure was or that we didn't have business cards and that we didn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, and do you have a website? And I'm like, yeah, but websites were brand new then. We're like a website. We didn't even know what they were talking about. Um, you know, so it's like, nah, we don't have any of that. We're just people who can solve your problem. And, uh, you know, people hire you that way, too. So uh, I forget what your question was, but that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say that? In the end, it's uh, mainly about solving problems for people. I mean, that's what many, many people mention when it comes to building businesses from scratch, that you should actually start by solving someone's problems or yeah. optimally your own problems. Right. Um, every, every product or service um, in the world is built around solving some form of problem. The problems may be big. The problems may be small. The problems may be something you can charge a lot for helping somebody solve. The problems may be something you can't. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, we've got, a, you know, here's a company that can't recruit employees. That's a big problem. Costs them hundreds of thousands, if not million dollars a year, if they do it poorly and if they recruit the wrong people and those people quit. So there's a certain amount that we can charge for that because we're solving a big problem. I walk up to a, a vending machine and I put my $2 in and I get a Diet Coke and the thing falls out. It's solving the problem that I'm thirsty. You know, it's not a big problem. It's, it's you know, it's a $2 problem. It's not a $2 million pro problem, but everything solves a problem. Even, even when you get something that, quote, doesn't solve a problem. Like, for example, um, we just went through Hurricane Ian here in Florida. We lost two of our huge Italian cypress trees in the front yard. You know, makes you want to cry. Just right over. So cut them down. And now I'm looking at getting two palm trees to replace there. Um, I don't know. What, what problem am I really solving? Those I don't really even need the trees. The, the trees are gone now. You look at the house. House looks fine. You know, what problem am I solving? I'm solving the problem that I'd like to have trees there. I mean, it's not even really a problem. It's a problem that's in my head. It's a want or a desire. And that want or desire, if it's strong enough, is still a problem. You know, and we're going to probably spend a couple thousand dollars on palm trees with the right salesperson who comes here and convinces me that they can solve my problem and put the right trees in. So it's always problems. Everything, everything is problems. And, and solutions, obviously, to them. Yeah, and in the in the case when uh, some salesperson would come to your house and uh, try to sell you some new trees, then you would eventually give that person a very clear no, right? But I think uh, today in the um, yeah in a century of uh, internet and email and uh, other messengers, that's not always the case. So oftentimes you don't even get a reply, which is also kind of rejection. How, how would you deal with that kind of rejection or that kind of no? Well, the first question is, is it a no? Um, I think a lot of people think that when they, they leave a voicemail message for somebody, you know, hey, Bob, my name is Richard Fenton. We've got this program. Give me a call back. I'd like to talk to you about it. And I don't hear from them. Um, you know, so first off, is that a no? Could be a no. Then again, maybe his 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 assistant deleted the message. You know, I, I it's not a no. It's an I don't know. So we like to think of a true nose is when people say no. Um, you know, in the in the old days, when when um, direct mail used to be the main way that people marketed things and they would send out 100,000 pieces and hope for a one half of 1% response, you know? Um, so did, you know, did really, did 99,500 people actually say no and reject them? How many of those things got lost in the mail? How many of those things got thrown in the trash before they were opened up? How many of them got opened up and they didn't understand it? I mean, on and on and on and on. So we think of the true rejection, true rejection is not when somebody just doesn't respond to your offer. 
True rejection is when they respond and you have a conversation and then they say, based on everything you tell me, no, I don't want to buy it. Those are the only no's that that we count as as valuable. And anybody who feels that they like they do a, a mailing or they send out emails and they didn't get a good response, yeah, they might be rejecting the email. If you get a 4% open rate, they may be rejecting the headline. And so there's a lot to learn from it. Um, but to think that, you know, that you were rejected or that this, this product or service can't be sold would be, you know, a fatal error. Because if it solves a problem, there's somebody out there who wants that problem solved. You just have to find those people and find the right way to communicate it to them. Many people would like to start their own businesses. But I think among those people, there are many who don't even really know what they want to do business with. Um, is there anything you'd recommend those people to do or to learn so that they eventually uh, yeah, are able to build their own businesses? Yeah, you know, um, I think it's a heck of a lot harder to start a business if you don't have something you already know that you want to do. On the other hand, I will say this. Um, if if you start out with just the idea that you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to launch your own business, uh, then you're kind of free to do anything. You know, I mean, the, the person who starts with, I'm going to be a wardrobe consultant. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach corporations how people in corporate America, how to dress for business. Okay, nothing wrong with that. There, there's a, there are businesses around that. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, it's that's a hard road because first off, you have to convince the company that their people are dressing poorly and that they would be better if they, that more effective if they dress better. And then you have to convince them that you're the right person to teach them rather than all the other people who are out there. It's like a multiple sell. And there's only so much money you can charge for it. So, you know, knowing what I know now about business, um, I would start I would start out by doing a, a Venn diagram. And for the, you know, I know most everybody knows what that is, but it's one of these circles that overlap. And I would do a three part Venn diagram and I would be very, very clear. I would start out with, um, you know, what are what are the big problems in the world that people need to have solved? Uh, who needs to have the problem solved and are they willing to have the problem solved or willing to pay to have the problem solved? And if you want to make it a four circle Venn diagram, you can say, how much are they willing? You know, are they willing to pay enough that I can make a good living at it? And if you do these exercises and you do them again and again and again, you just keep filling these things in with different ideas. And then eventually you say, oh, here's something that I like to do that is a problem that I can contact people who would like to have it solved and they're willing to pay to have it solved. And if you can get in that middle piece, right, you can get to where you find that little thing. So it's obviously easier if you have something you like doing because you get the extra circle. Um, you don't, It's not just that you get the extra part of the Venn diagram, but that's the piece that keeps you in it. That's the piece that keeps you going when times get hard. So You know, people go like, you know, I'm going to I, I'm going to um, I'm going to open a gas station. Why? I hear there's a lot of money in gas. You know, OK, well, you know, good luck, because the minute things get tough, you're going to go like, why did I even do this? And if you can't answer the question why you did it, then you're almost likely you know, going to throw the towel in too early. And so um, it's great if you know what you want to do. But there's still lots of businesses you can start, you know, without having to without having to um, have something that, that you're driven by personally. So in the end, uh, having a good why to do things is probably a good motivator, right? Yeah, you know, this idea of, of you know, um, having, the, having the why, uh, I've, I've always thought of it. I've always thought of it when you watch a, um, a police crime drama on television, And you see the the cars are out front and the lights are flashing and the yellow tape is up and all the police are standing there. And then the detective walks over, right? The detective walks over and, you know, says, what have we got? And they go like, it's a male, 34 years old. Um, he's, you know, he uh, shot in the heart. He's laying dead on the, on the living room floor. 
uh, the wife is the suspect, right? And then the detective always says, well, what's the motive? What's the motive? What is the motivation? Why do you think the wife did it? Is she the one that she have a strong enough motivation to do it? In other words, he's asking why, why, why would she do it? And so, you know, we, we think of the word, we think of the word motivation. Um, and we always think of it as like somebody trying to motivate us from the outside and, and tell us that we can do it and show us how much money we can make. Um, the reality is the greatest motivation will always be, the greatest motive will always be the reasons that you have inside of yourself and why you would do something, why you would try something, why you would take a chance. And so, yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a, a big fan. I'm a big fan of knowing why you're going to do something, because in the end, that's going to be the reason that you persevere. And maybe something that's in between the why inside you and outside, um, maybe a reason of helping others and uh, serving others. I saw that you um, had an interview or have some kind of connection to Bob Berg, uh, the, yeah. one of the authors of uh, The Go-Giver. Right. Um, do Do you think that this is one thing which, uh, yeah, might be a very good motivation for people? Yeah, you know the 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 go giver. And by the way, Bob is a close friend, and he's a great, great guy. Probably one of the best human beings, um, you know, we've ever come in contact with. And uh, you know the the go giver concept can be looked at. Um, in, in, from two different perspectives, in my mind, um, the one is. Uh, it's, it's give people what they want, be a giver, right? The other is more tactical. It's more strategic. It's, Hey, if you give enough, right, then people will give back to you. So in some cases, people are just giving because they want to give, they have no expectation of return. In other situations, we give and give and give, and we're like waiting, <laughs> you know, when, when does it come back? When, when do I get the payoff or when am I going to finally, when am I going to finally, um, you know, get some uh, bang for my buck, some return on my invested giving, if you will. And I'll just tell you a fun, I'll just tell you a funny story. Uh, I won't use the name here, but there was a big major sales trainer that we wanted to network with for many years. We contacted him. We sent him packages. We called his office. We we did. I mean, for years. I'm mean, know five, six years. I mean, just trying to network with this with this man, and nowhere. We got nowhere. And then we were at a conference, and his daughter had done an introduction um, for him on video, and it was really cute. And I, I thought it was great. And and he was, you know, he was there. To, and I took a piece of paper and I wrote her name. I said, the introduction you did for your dad was really great. I'm sure he's very proud of you, you know, and then I put Richard and I went over and I handed it to him and I said, Hey, I wrote this for your daughter. I thought she'd like it. And he read it and went, wow, that's really nice. So the next morning we're all at breakfast. He's sitting at his table. We're sitting at our table. We get up to leave and I walked over and I said, Hey, just want to say goodbye. And oh, I, I, excuse me, I was going over to say goodbye. And as I walked over, He said, whatever you want, he said, the answer is yes. After all those years of asking, 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 we gave one thing and then suddenly he's giving back. And so there's a big message there. Bob is super onto something. And if you can get the combination of the real true desire to give, because you really want to give, and then the understanding of the strategy of giving in order to get then man, it, it, can't, it can't get more powerful than that. I absolutely agree. And I wonder if there's uh, something which uh, other people eventually could give to you. So is there anything, any challenges you're currently facing with your business, with your brand or something where people may eventually support you? Oh boy, um, I'm a better giver than I am a taker. <laughs> <laughs> That's just that's just the fact. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm going to put I don't have an answer, but I'm going to put this in the category of of personal flaws. This is a this is a personal flaw of mine. 
And that is this, this belief that somehow um, I can do it on my own. Um, and I say on my own, I mean, Andrea and I together, but you know, still without having to ask for help from other people, that's a real bad flaw. Uh, I think, I think performance can be accelerated significantly uh, if you're, if you're willing to ask for help. And every now and then I, you know, I, I realize that I don't know what I'm doing and I'll call somebody and, and ask for advice and it always pays off. But, um, you know, my, my answer is right now, I don't have a thing that I can think of, but there's probably a hundred things that I should have been able to articulate. And so, yeah, always be willing, always be willing to accept help from other people. Then if people think that they could eventually help you, um, where can they contact you? Ah, okay. Well, they certainly can do that. Um, uh, you know, if you if you'd like to purchase the book, feel free now. So Amazon.com, we have the book, the book Go for No. Um, if you want to go to the website, gofornow.com, I think you'll just find it interesting. There's some there's some videos and go for no keynote. Um, there's a couple of videos to watch. There's a, a quiz in there that will help you determine your no quotient. Um, in other words, how many no's are you willing to hear before you decide that you're going to throw in the towel? And uh, it would be make us very happy if anybody visited our our website um, or read the book, and uh, that would be really nice. Cool. Then again, thank you so much for taking the time. You're you're welcome, Sam. This is a delight. Thank you for taking part in this Never Employed Chat. Subscribe to my YouTube channel for more interviews with business owners and investors, or simply listen to the audio version in your favorite podcast directory. Make sure to follow me on all your preferred social media platforms so that you never miss life-changing business tips. You find me on every platform with the account name samhartman.com. Start a business, become successful, and tell me about it. See you next time.